All right, good morning, Upper Church. I'm glad you guys are excited. I'm excited. I don't know if you were here last week or not, but last week we did something that was kind of uh, unusual. We, uh, we stretched out our prayers before the Lord, and we've got this prayer box up here. And what was amazing is that just he, how God just moved and worked. And we did the last, and we gave opportunity for everybody just to write down whatever was coming against him. And just write down their prayers and, and put them in this prayer box. And it was absolutely awesome to see all these people come and just drop their prayers in. All these things that's, got, this, all these things that's coming against them. And what's amazing with this, and this is what I couldn't wait to share with you, is that already I've had people contact me this week about how God's already moving audaciously in their lives and how even jobs are coming up and how they're touching their family members and touching those that are sick. I mean, God's already moving and working in an amazing way just by, just by laying out our prayers before God. So if you, if you missed last week, you definitely check it out online. It was absolutely awesome. And this whole idea of audacious, was, it's been pretty neat. We learned the first week about this audacious man. His name was Gideon, and he was a leader of an army, but he used to be a farmer. And uh, he defeated an entire nation with a kazoo and a mason jar with a candle in it. And it was absolutely amazing how God just caused all these people to cause confusion. And 186,000 people died because of a mason jar with a candle in it and a little bitty trumpet. And then we last week learned about this audacious prayers about how this King Hezekiah was, got this bad news and how he took this letter he received he received from the Midianites, from this evil king, Serenabob. And then he just stretched it out before the Lord. He took, went to church and he stretched it out before the Lord. And God just took care of business. And it was absolutely awesome. And this is this power that we have, that we have access to. And I don't know about you, but I've seen people go through life. And almost like they're going to die the same way they're just living their whole life. Like there's nothing exciting about it in their lives. And the only thing they get excited about, you know, is maybe their kids or their grandkids' birthday parties. And, and, that, and that's it. And not that we should be excited about those things. We, we need to be excited about, you know, for our kids. And I hope a really, really long time from now, grandkids for me. Just we get excited about those things. And we should, we should get excited about, about football. We should get excited about those things. But then... The most exciting thing that we have to get excited about is our relationship with God and how he can move and how he can work. Like, if somebody was to write a book about you, I wonder what they would say. I wonder what they would say about me. Would they say that, oh, he was a good dad or he was a good parent or he worked hard every day? I mean, what would they, what would they say about us? If they, at the end of your life, if somebody was to write a book about you, what would it say? If we start thinking about these things, I wonder what my book would be filled with. I mean, I hope it would be a pop-up book full of accent and excitement. What would your book say? Would, I mean, would, would it say that you just was an average person, you know, paid your bills, paid your taxes, wasn't in jail, kept your nose clean? I mean, is that what, is that what your book would say? Because I want my book to say he was a wicked awesome dad. He was the best husband of, of anybody's ever seen. I mean, led a church, he was excited, he was excited about his relationship with God. I mean, I want my book to be like in your face excited. I'm talking like, that's what I want my book to be like. But what about your book? If somebody wants to come to you and write a book about you and say, hey, we'd like to write a book about you. In the, after the interview where they say, we have nothing to write about. You're like, boring. <laughs> I mean, I want my life to be so amazing. It could be on MTV or TLC or something. I mean, I, I, mean, I want my life to be that audacious, that exciting. Not MTV. We need something else. Um, <laughs> Lifetime or something. You know, I mean, something exciting about our lives. And maybe you think that, okay, I, I can't do that. I mean, my, my life just, it's not that exciting. I mean, we just can't do that. Or can we do that? Now, we've been talking about this power that we have down inside of us, this, this power that we have. And see, I've got, this, I've got this idea that if God has done something amazing in somebody's life, especially those in the Bible, he can do it for me. I mean, if God can use Moses to part the waters and walk across on dry ground, he can do that for me. If Peter can walk on top of water, I mean, what can he do in my life? I believe that with all my heart. And so this power verse has kind of been our key verse going through this entire series. And I hope you've, you've seen it so many times now, you're starting to get tired of it. But it's Romans 8, 11. And I love this. It says, The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Jesus Christ from the dead, He will give life to your mortal bodies by the same Spirit living within you. We have this power down inside of us, the same power that raised Jesus up from the dead. It's the same power that lives in us. But where so many of us are walking around living boring lives, all we do is just go to work and come home and have the same argument every single evening. What do you want for dinner? I don't care. What do you want? I don't care. 
What do you want? Well, pick something. It don't matter. All right, we're going to have biscuits and gravy. I don't want that. I thought you said it didn't matter. Well, it don't matter. And it's the same thing over and over. What do you want to watch on TV? I don't care what you want to watch. I'm going to watch football. I don't want to watch football. You said it didn't matter. Well, it don't matter. Well, you have this, I'm, this same boring life. I mean, if, if that's what our book is going to be filled with, when we have this power inside of us, I mean, God help for us to live this mediocre, boring lives. We need to live an exciting life filled with excitement. We've got the power of God inside of us. Amen. I mean, is it not to be something to be excited about? We've got this, this power. And it's like we've got our hands stuck in our pocket saying, God can't use me. And many of us will say the same thing. God can't use me. Oh, we can't do that. That's baloney. Because you've got power inside of you. And what we have to do, we just got to tap into that and let God use it. We've got this power, this amazing power. That's why I, lo- I like this verse. We've got this power. So if somebody was to write a book about you, what would it be? We just say, oh, man, he tapped into this power, and it was, it was nuts. This guy was, this guy was crazy. This, that woman, wow, she was crazy. I mean, she, this, the things that she did, it was amazing. I mean, what would, what would they say about us? And I want them to say, man, he was an audacious man. He just lived this unbelievable boldness. He loved God, and he carried out this great boldness of faith. And many of us would say, man, that would be awesome, but I don't think that I could do that. So here's my question to you. Can you be audacious? And to say what audacious is, it's about living this big, bold faith. And last week, Tony talked to us about these BHAGs, these unbelievable, audacious goals that we would just set and we we would try to achieve them. An unbelievable goal, an unbelievable risk, instead of playing it safe. There were these big, bold risks. Can you be audacious? Now, I would argue with you and say, yes, you can. There's no reason why you can't, because why? This verse, we have the power of God inside of us. We should live audaciously, big, bold risk, so that when people see us, they don't just see you and your job and the clothes you wear. They see the power of God living down inside of you. That's what I want to tap into. That's what I want to spread. Not my favorite sports team. Yeah, go Hokies. Someday they'll win. (laughs) But we need to spread this power that we have this amazing power so today i want to share a man with you in the bible who had the same struggle had the same struggle if you have your bibles you can turn to matthew chapter three and i think this is going to be amazing because this guy i mean he was nuts he i mean he lived audaciously his name was john the baptist and i know we had this idea in this picture of john the baptist and you can read the whole description about him he looked kind of funny he had a weird diet too his diet consists of locusts and honey you can say ooh, because that's an unbelievable diet, and that's what he ate, locusts and honey. And he looked kind of funny, too. He had this leather belt, and he had camel hair for, like, clothing. He had this wild hairdo. He was in his 30-somethings, and he came out. He had been in this wilderness. He had been on this fast. He had been on this diet, and now here he is in his 30-somethings. He's the cousin of Jesus, and he came out preaching and teaching about Jesus. And this is just amazing. This is in uh, Matthew chapter 3, starting with the first verse. It says, in those days, John the Baptist came to the Judean wilderness and began preaching. His message was, repent of your sins and turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is near. In verse 3, the prophet Isaiah was speaking about John when he said, he is a voice shouting in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord's coming, clear the road for him. So this is predicted all the way back in the Old Testament, the book of Isaiah, about John the Baptist. He had one job. That's why I like it. He had one job, clear the road for Jesus. His job was to tell everybody that the Messiah was coming. That was his only job. You just go tell everybody that Jesus is coming. That was his only job to do. He had one job. Go tell everybody that Jesus was coming. He had just one job. And so he finally came out. It's time for his ministry. He went public and began to tell everybody that Jesus was coming. The Messiah was coming. And this was his only job. And he did it very well. He was down at this Jordan River. and He was preaching and teaching people about Jesus And people were coming, getting baptized, one after the other, after the other. But he did something that was amazing. God had told him that he was going to be the one to identify the Messiah. He was going to be the one to identify that Jesus was here, the Son of God. And so one day, Jesus came down to the Jordan River. And from a distance, from a distance, John the Baptist saw him. And I love what it said, because he said, Behold the Lamb. I mean, as soon as he saw him, he said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. 
He recognized Jesus. Jesus came down to the water and he said, I want you to baptize me. So John the Baptist, he baptized him. And this is what's awesome. This is what happened. This is verse 16. After this, after he baptized Jesus. So after his baptism, Jesus came up out of the water. The heavens were opened and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and setting on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my dearly loved son who brings me great joy. He saw this power set down upon Jesus. And here he was, he was just baptizing the people. He was the only one that was teaching people about God at that time. It's a very dark time because for 400 years, nobody had heard any preaching. No preaching, nobody heard any word from God. So 400 years later, he carries John the Baptist. He looks a little funny in his camel hair and his little leather belt and his weird locusts and honey diet, teaching people, hey, Jesus is coming. The Messiah, the Son of God is coming. And everybody's like, well, what do we do? And he said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And they were being baptized and baptized one after the other. And finally he looks up and he sees Jesus. And here's his purpose. He's fulfilling his purpose. He sees Jesus. Behold the Lamb of God which take away the sin of the world. Behold the Lamb of God which take away the sin of the world. And so he recognizes Jesus. Jesus comes down. When Jesus comes up out of the water, John the Baptist gets confirmation. Here's his confirmation. We all wonder, are we doing what we're supposed to be doing? We all wonder that. Men expect, we wonder, are we doing what we're supposed to be doing? And John the Baptist, no doubt, I'm sure he struggled with this too. And God gave him exact confirmation. As soon as Jesus come up out of the water, and I love that whenever we baptize people and they come up out of that water, that, that, just that first breath that they take, it, it's so fresh and it's so exciting. They come up out of the water. And Jesus, he come up out of the water. And immediately, he saw this power of God set down upon Jesus like a dove. And then he heard this confirmation from God. He heard, John the Baptist heard this voice. It was God. It was our Heavenly Father. He said, this is my son. I love who's bringing me great joy. This is my son. This is it. John the Baptist got confirmation. He was doing exactly what he was supposed to be doing. And many of us were wondering, are we doing what we're supposed to be doing? I mean, are we going through life? Are we just going through the motions? Or are we doing exactly what God has called us to do? And we start examining our life. Yes, you're bringing money in. And yes, you're putting food on your table. And yes, your family has a roof over their head. But I'm talking about outside of those daily activities. Are we doing what God has called us to do? Because John, he still had to eat. He still had to have somewhere to live. He still had these normal activities. I'm, so I'm talking beyond that. Be, beyond the normal. Beyond your daily routine. Beyond your farming and your gardening. Beyond your job at Eastman or at the hospital. Wherever it may be. Beyond that. What does our life show? John the Baptist got exact confirmation. He was doing exactly what God called him to do when he saw the power of God rest upon him. And that same power lives right here inside of us. Do we, do we realize that? The same power. And John saw this. He got exact confirmation. And the problem is with John, people didn't like him. And they didn't like him at all. They didn't like what he stood for. They didn't like what he taught. And here he, I mean, he went from this amazing experience telling people, and he went on. He went on telling everybody, hey, Jesus is here. I've seen him. Jesus is here. I've seen him. I've seen him. Jesus is right here, and he's telling everybody, repent, be baptized. But some people didn't like him. Because Jesus, he went off and started his ministry. You can keep on reading the text, and Jesus goes up into the wilderness. He's up there for 40 days and 40 nights. He's praying, and he's fasting. He gets tempted by the devil. He comes back down, and there you see Jesus doing this, going to this wedding in Canaan, where he performs this miracle of turning the water into wine. Jesus starts his ministry. John the Baptist, he's left over to do his own. Here he is with his own followers, his own disciples following him, and he's telling everybody, Jesus is coming. Jesus is here. He's right here. You can go see him. He's right here. I baptize him. I saw this crazy event. I saw this power of God sit down and rest upon him. It was just like a dove. And I heard the voice of God, and he was telling people all this. And people didn't like it. Finding him so much that he ended up landing him in prison. Now, do you have people that in your life that don't, they don't like you? They don't like the way you look. They don't like your family. They don't like your church. They don't like you talking about God. They definitely don't like you talking about your relationship with Jesus. They don't like your haircut or your clothes. They just don't like you. And we all have people like that that don't like us. Well, they absolutely despised John the Baptist for what he stood for. They despised him so much that landed him in prison. And if you flip over... A few, ver- few chapters, this is Matthew chapter 11, you pick this back up, we hear back from John the Baptist. Because there's a dark spot that we don't hear. All we know is that he lands himself in prison, that's where this starts at. And this is Matthew chapter 11, verse 1. 
He says, when Jesus had finished giving these instructions to his, uh, to his 12 disciples, he went out to teach and preach in towns throughout the region. So Jesus was doing his own ministry. But verse 2, John the Baptist, who was in prison, he heard about these things the Messiah was doing. So he sent his disciples to ask Jesus, are you the Messiah that we've been expecting, or should we keep looking for somebody else? So here he is, doing what we often do, question things. Oh, man, am I doing what I'm supposed to be doing? I mean, I had just one job. I had one job, just one job. I was supposed to tell everybody about Jesus, that Jesus was coming. And when I see him, I was supposed to tell him he's here. He's right here. And now John the Baptist has questioned everything. He's questioned his ministry. He's questioned his whole life because he finds himself sitting in a prison, locked up, chained up. He can't get out. He can't tell anybody else about Jesus. He's locked up. Now, many of us, if we were locked up in prison, what we'd be focused on is getting out of there. We'd be meeting with the lawyers. We'd be meeting with Bubba to try to break us out of jail. We're going to be meeting with, we're going to get our way out of there. But he's, he doesn't. He's not meeting with his lawyers. He's not meeting with any of his buddies about trying to get out. He's meeting with his disciples, and he's talking about his purpose, his life purpose. Did, did I do it? Did, did I do my job? Here I am. I'm in prison. I'm locked up, I'm changed up. Did, did I do it? Did, did I really meet the Messiah? I'm here, Jesus is, he's out teaching and everywhere. And John finds himself in prison. And some of you right now today, you are looking around at your life and you're examining your life and you feel like you are locked up in a prison. That all the world is against you. That nobody cares about you. That some of us are even believing this lie that the devil's telling us that even God has forgotten about you. And I want you to understand this morning that that is a lie straight from the very pits of hell. Because God loves you so much, he already gave you Jesus. And with Jesus, we have hope, we have freedom, and we have peace. This is the same peace, this is the same power that John has. But now he's sitting in prison, locked up. And the one thing he's worried about, the one thing he's concerned about, is his purpose. Did he do it? Oh, but us, we'd be, we'd be whining. We'd be writing letters to the congressman and to the president. We, we're going to get ourselves out of jail. But not John the Baptist. He's focused on his purpose, fulfilling exactly what God had given him to do. And he finds himself now. He was doing it so well, it's locked him up in prison. So he sends word to Jesus. He sends his disciples, guys, you need to go find Jesus. So he had this business meeting with his disciples. Not about a prison break but to make sure that he's doing exactly what God has called him to do. And so here they are, they're meeting, they have this ceremony, there's this meeting, and then he sends them off. So he sends his disciples to ask Jesus, are you the one we've been looking for? Are, are you him? Now he already had his confirmation, right? He saw this power of God rest down upon him. But he still questioned, just like we do. We doubt it. We question ourselves. Men, we question whether or not we're a good enough dad or a good enough husband. Ladies, we always question about the way that we look and what we're doing. Are we raising our kids right? We always question these things. And John the Baptist is no exception. He's wondering. He's questioning. Am I doing? I had one job, and now I'm in prison. And I'm sure that he's feeling like he failed God. So he sends his disciples to go ask Jesus, and I like what happened. So they go and ask Jesus. This is verse 4. So they go and they ask Jesus, and Jesus told them, he said, Go back to John and tell him what you've heard and seen. Now, I love this because he doesn't answer the question. He doesn't answer John's question. He said, go back and tell him what you've seen. You've heard and seen in verse 5. And he says, the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cured, the deaf hear, and the dead are raised to life, and the good news is being preached to the poor. In verse 6, and tell him God blesses those who do not turn away because of me. So Jesus didn't answer his question. He said, I want you to go tell him what you've heard and seen. Go, go tell him what you've heard and seen. And I, I kept studying this. I think, well, why in the world did he tell him that? Have you ever heard the expression, the proof is in the pudding? I mean, you, people can talk a big game. And I, I had this, uh, I've had this, this, aunt, this aunt. She absolutely made the best banana pudding. It was the best. Like, I couldn't wait until Thanksgiving so we could have Aunt Norma's banana pudding. I'm sure your granny makes it good, but my Aunt Norma can make it so much better than yours. I promise you, it was that good. One, one bite of this. Oh, man, you was hooked for life. Like, all other banana puddings fall short of this one banana. One bite is all it took. And you may argue with me. 
But the proof was in the banana put. You one bite, and you're like, oh man, that's the best I've ever had. I have died and gone hit. I mean, it is that finger licking good. It was awesome. The proof was in it. All you had to do was take one bite. And that's exactly what Jesus is telling these disciples of John the Baptist. Hey, you want the proof that he's asking these questions? The proof is in what you're hearing and what you're seeing. The proof is in the pudding. It's what, it, the proof is right here. You go tell him all the things that you've seen, and he confirms that. I like it. He confirms it. The blind see, the lame walk. I love this. The lepers are cured, the deaf hear, and the dead are raised to life. And the good news is being preached to the poor. Here's the evidence. So he doesn't give him a direct answer. He says, look at the evidence. We want to know, are, are we doing what God has called us to do? Are we living a life? Well, let's see this. Let's look at the evidence. What does our life show? Again, if somebody's going to write a book about us, if we're going to have a book in the Bible, labeled John or, or Philip or, or Robert or Paul, whatever your name is, and it was a book in the Bible, what would it say? The proof is in the pudding. Your life, whatever it shows out, that is your proof. Whether or not you're doing what God has called you to do, it's what is you are, not your daily routine, outside of that. And even in your daily routine, man, you can glorify God all through what you're doing. All your actions can glorify God. So he's telling these disciples, he says, hey, go back and tell John this. The blind see, the lame walk, the deaf hear. I love this. The dead are raised to life. There's this power of God is going about people. And even this good news is being preached to the poor. This good news is being spread. I love this. The proof is so much. It's in the pudding. And he tells you one more thing. He tells you one more thing. I love this. This one last thing. He says, And God blesses those who do not turn away because of me. God blesses those who don't turn away because of me. What is he sharing? What, what's he telling? He's telling us to not quit. He's telling John the Baptist, I know you're in prison. I know you're sitting in a cell. I know that it's damp and dark in that dungeon. I know you're locked up. Don't quit. We all know people who have, you know, they got saved and they started going to church and then they quit. And I know that you've seen those. And sometimes as we've been, we kind of fall into those temptations to even quit ourselves, that we would quit. And here he's telling John the Baptist, don't quit. God blesses those who don't quit who just plow through whatever it is that they're going through he's in prison and maybe here today maybe you've been in prison maybe maybe i visited prison but i've never been in prison i visited prison in mexico they ain't nobody want to go to jail in mexico <laughs> nobody they 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 don't even feed you there it's 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 rough it's rough and here he is john the baptist he's sitting there in prison wondering what in the world's going on Am I doing what God's called me to do? Have I fulfilled it? And maybe you're here today and you're wondering, are you, are you doing what God's called you to do? And he, he tells him, don't quit. Even in prison, don't quit. Here's the evidence. Don't quit. I love this. Tell them, and tell him God blesses those who do not turn away because of me. Keep fighting. If we want to know if we're doing what God has called us to do, it's whether or not we've quit. Because the only way that we can fail is if we quit. And I don't know about you, but I plan on going to my grave. I'm, I'm going down swinging with everything that I've got. I'm not going to quit being that dad. I'm not going to quit being that father. I hope I have to be like, carried out of here. I'm, I'm okay dying in here. Not quit. I mean, keep fighting. And that's what he's saying is that we would bless those who do not turn away because of me. Now, how in the world does all this apply to us? We're talking about John the Baptist. I know you're not baptizing people left and right. I know you're not down to the Jordan River. What are, what are we doing? Our life, what are we doing? Because right now we're needing this evidence. We're needing confirmation that we're doing what God has called us to do. Well, looking at the life of John the Baptist, there's three things that we can draw away from this. How we can live this audacious life. So that when, at the end of our life, when somebody wants to write a book about us, when somebody wants to lie, write a book about you, so they can say, man, this, look at this audacious life. And look at how awesome that they lived. Well, this first thing that we have got to understand, this first thing that we've got to do, and that's what I like about what John the Baptist is. First thing that we need to do is do what God has called us to do. Very first thing. You, you want to know if you're doing what God has called you to do? You want to know if you're fulfilling your purpose? You want to you know if you're doing everything right? Do what God has called you to do. We talked about the evidence being right there, the proof is in the pudding. Then go do what God has called you to do. 
Well, I don't know what God's called me to do. Yes, you do. He's called you to live in a life full of faith, this audacious faith. Just listen to God and do what He says. For some of us, what that means is we need to step up being our parental roles. That We need to step up being a parent. That we would fulfill those roles with everything that we've got. Some of us, we've gotten lazy. And it's time that we man up, that we step up and fight and do what God has called us to do. If you have a role of a husband, if you have a role of a father, if you have a role of being a mother or a parent or a grandparent, step up your role. Outside of that, maybe God has called you to speak to your neighbors and and invite people to church or maybe open your home up to a Bible study or open your home up to invite people in just so you can cook them a meal. Whatever that looks like, do what God has called you to do. And this is what John the Baptist did. God called him to do one purpose, one job. Make the way for Jesus. That's what I like about this translation of the Bible, this NLT. Clear the road. Just clear the road for him. Just make a path for Jesus, pointing everybody to him. And I don't know what God has called you to do, but one thing he's called you to do is to live by faith. Not by sight, just live by faith. That you would step up and live your life by faith. Outside of that, maybe God has called you to do something else. For me, God called me to, to start a church. That's what God called me to do. And I'm not saying you're a church starter, but maybe God's called you to, like I said, to start a Bible study or to start something, to do, to do something. Then do it. Whatever it is God's called you to do. Well, I can't do that. I'm not qualified. I'm not good enough. I don't talk good enough. Listen, if God has called you to do it, then you already have everything you need. Everything that you need. We have it. Don't doubt yourself. Trust God. And that's what he's saying. Do what God has called you to do. This is what John the Baptist did. I love this. The second thing that we can do, and here's where we fall short. Because what John the Baptist did, he was stuck in prison. And if I'm stuck in prison, I'm going to write everybody, but he didn't. Instead, he didn't focus on his circumstances. He focused on his calling. I like what he did. And if we, we audacious life, just like, just like he did, just like John the Baptist did. We want to live audacious. We want to live this amazing life. So at the end of our life, people can write a book about us. Then quit focusing on your circumstances. Oh, man, the tire went flat. The washing needs broke again. Then praise God, you even had one to begin with. I mean, we've got to stop focusing on our circumstances and focus on what God has called us to do. Because even though your washing machine may be broke, guess what? You're still a parent. Invest in those kids. You're, you're, still a hus- you're still a spouse. Invest in that relationship. Just because your car's broke down doesn't mean, you, doesn't mean you can't invite somebody to church. Do whatever it is God's called you to do. Oh man, the whole world is crushing down on me. The whole world is against me. It may be. But we serve a God who is bigger than all these circumstances. And John the Baptist knew that. And his main purpose, his main focus was not his prison cell. It was his purpose. Was he doing what God had called him to do? And here's why he was questioning it. He was locked up. And do you understand he was awaiting execution? He was here in his prison cell, all locked up, wondering if he had fulfilled what God had called him to do. Instead of wondering about his execution, instead of awaiting, wondering what was going to happen or when it was going to take place, he was more concerned about his calm than he was in circumstances. I would have a hard time with that. Somebody's wanting to kill me. Somebody says a bad word against me, whether it be on Facebook or whatever. I'm like, ah, but John the Baptist is awaiting death. And he focused on his relationship with God. I want to please you, God. But do we want to please God this morning? I mean, this is what an audacious life is. We can have an audacious life. We can have this audacious mission-filled life if we would just do what God has called us to do and quit focusing on the circumstances. And there's one last thing, and this is what gets us. Don't quit. Just don't quit. There's times that you're going to feel overwhelmed. When you feel the weight of the world just weighted down on your shoulders. And I don't care how old you are. I don't care how young you are. I don't care if you're in school. You've got a job. You've got no job. There's times that we just feel the weight of the world just pressing down upon us. Don't quit. You keep pursuing God. You keep fighting through. You keep plowing through and doing what God has called you to do. Because I promise you, 
that the God that we serve is far greater than any circumstances, that this God that we serve is greater than any weight that's placed upon your shoulders. There's going to be times it's going to be even hard for you to get out of bed. You're like, oh man, I just, I just don't want to. I'm, I'm struggling here. I'm, I'm struggling. Or, man, I'm eight weeks prayed and I got this morning sitting. He said, plow through it. Don't quit. We've been teaching this to our girls about don't quit. Don't quit. Because everybody knows that quitters quit. Don't want them to quit. Because there's times that life gets hard. It gets so hard. And the only way that you're going to fail is if you just roll over and quit. John the Baptist, he didn't quit. He kept plowing through. And here you are, though, even though he was here waiting, waiting in prison and getting ready to die on this execution, he is more concerned about fulfilling God's purpose for his life. He didn't quit. He kept right on going. He didn't quit. So what I'm telling you is, fight. You fight for what God has given you. You fight for your purpose. You, you fight for your family. You fight for your marriage. You fight for your kids. You fight. Fight and don't quit. Don't give up. You keep fighting. And you watch what God will do through you. Fight and don't quit. John the Baptist, here he is. He's stuck in prison and he keeps on fighting. And he keeps on fighting. All the way to the very end. There's no rest area. There's no, there's no time for us to take a break. We keep on fighting. And we keep on fighting. John the Baptist did this. And he kept right on fighting. Could you imagine what would happen if every one of us here, that we took up this this audacious mission, that we take of this audacious life, that we're going to live boldly. That we're, we're going to invite anybody we see, we're going to start inviting them to church because they need Jesus. That they even though that may get uncomfortable during family, I mean, we're getting ready to come at the most uncomfortable time of the year, Thanksgiving. And you're going to be invited to your family's house that some of you, you don't even like them. And it's uncomfortable. And it's hard. Because some of you have been arguing the same arguments for 20 years. And maybe this is a year that you're going to get over it. And fight for your family. Because it's time that you're going to eat banana pudding in peace. <laughs> Are you ready to fight for your family? To, to fight. Don't quit. This time of year that we're coming upon. So many people get so sad and depressed because they're focused on their circumstances instead of Jesus. Could you imagine what would happen if all of us, if we, if we took up this attitude, just like, just like John the Baptist, that we would fight, even though the things seem to be coming against us, that we would fight and not quit. I mean, could you imagine what kind, of, what kind of change would take place in our homes and in your family? Could you imagine how this would filter to our workplaces and our schools? I mean, I want my kids to, to go around to all of their friends and say, man, my daddy is a fighter. He ain't no quitter. He don't just lay around. He's fighting for us. Could you imagine what happened if we would fight and not quit? How that would spread into other people? How that we would fight when we go to the grocery store? That we would fight for that cashier? That we're going to get them to Jesus. We're going to get them to Jesus. And we're going to keep inviting. I don't care how many times you tell me no. I'm going to invite you. And I'm going to invite you. That we would fight for these people. John the Baptist had this fighting attitude. And in the end, Jesus had something amazing to say about him. And this is what I want Jesus to say about me. And I love this. This is in verse 11. Uh, John's disciples, he left. Their, their disciples left. So John the Baptist, he sent word through his disciples to Jesus. To ask him, hey, are you him or should we look for another? Or are you the one we've been looking for or do we need to look for somebody else? And Jesus told him, he said, now listen, here's, you go back and tell him this. The proof is in the pudding. Tell him what you've heard and seen. You know, the blind see, the deaf can hear, the dead are raised to life, the gospel is preached to the poor. You go back and tell him this. After these disciples go away, Jesus turns now to the rest of the crowd that's there, and this is what he says. He says, I tell you the truth, of all who have ever lived, none is greater than John the Baptist. So up to this point, he said, none is greater than John the Baptist. Here, he's in prison, and Jesus says, of everybody else, none is greater than John the Baptist. Anybody that's ever lived, none is greater than John the Baptist. He said, he's the greatest one. He wasn't focused on his circumstances. He was focused on Jesus and fulfilling his purpose. And he says, none is greater than John the Baptist. But here's what he says about you. I love this. Here's what Jesus said about you. Yet, even the least person in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Now, why would Jesus say this about us? Why, why would Jesus say this about me and you? That we could be greater than John the Baptist. 
And here's why. And I want you to get this. Here's the best part. Because we have power living down inside of us. That Romans 8 verse 11 that we read earlier, we've got this power, this Holy Spirit living right here inside of us. John the Baptist, he didn't even have that. He was just doing what God had called him to do. Because Jesus hadn't died and went to heaven yet. The Holy Spirit hadn't come yet. And now we've got this power of the Holy Spirit living down inside of us. We have access to more than even what John the Baptist had. And Jesus said, of anybody that's ever lived, none is greater than John the Baptist. And we can be even greater than John the Baptist because we have access to power right here inside of us all by putting our faith in jesus christ we have power god help us live a mediocre life we have this power living inside of us the same power that raised jesus christ up from the dead lives in you and jesus said there's none greater than you you don't have to walk around defeated you don't have to walk around this mediocre life you have power inside of you three things he gave you three things that we could do like john the baptist did that we could live this audacious life one, do what God's called you to do. Whatever that is, do what God's called you to do. Second thing, don't focus on your circumstances. Do your purpose. And the third thing, don't quit. God help, whatever you do, don't quit. Fight for your family. You fight for what God's called you to do, and don't quit. In the very end, when we cross through those pearly gates, when heaven becomes our home, and we get to see Jesus face to face, and he gets to look at you and said, you didn't quit. Well done, good and faithful servant. Those are the words that I want to hear. Quitters don't get to hear those words. We're not quitters, we're fighters. And we're going to fight for what God has called us to do. I'm not a quitter this morning. I'm going to fight. I'm going to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes just for a moment as we pray together. Father God, how awesome you are. And know that in our lives, God, that we all struggle. We all have these things that's coming against us. And I pray right now, God, that the power of your Holy Spirit would set down upon us. Speaking to us right now, God. As you continue to pray, there's some of you here this morning and you are just absolutely overwhelmed. You're overwhelmed and you've been focusing on your circumstances and right now God is speaking to you and says it's time to start focusing on Him instead of your circumstances. It may be your marriage. It may be your family. It may be your job. It may be your house. It may be your vehicles. It may be your finances. Whatever it is, I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you that you, you know what, I'm tired of focusing on my circumstances. I want to focus on Jesus. Hands are already going up. I want to pray for you that I'm, I'm, I'm not going to focus on my circumstances. I'm going to focus it all up on Jesus. I want to pray for you. Just slip your hand and say, just pray for me. I'm going to focus on Jesus. I just want to pray for you. Father God, how awesome and powerful you are. And God, we realize, just like John the Baptist, sometimes we thought this weight of the world is down upon us. And I pray right now, God, that you would free us, that we would feel your powerful peace in our lives. And as you lead and as you guide us, God, we're going to focus on you. Satan tries to distract us. And Satan tries to, to distract us with all these things, with the weight of the world, God. But even though that we feel the weight of the world upon us, God, we are going to focus on you, your love, your peace. And even when Satan tells us we're not good enough, and even though that he may tell us that we failed, we're going to focus on you. Because as long as we have breath in our lungs and as long as our heart is beating, you have a plan and a purpose for us. And I pray, God, right now that we'd fulfill your purpose and we would live an audacious life. As you continue to pray, there's those of you here today, there's of you here today that God is telling you, all right, it's time. It's time. Just like John the Baptist, he had a purpose, he had a mission. God's given you a purpose and a mission. It's time to fulfill it. Maybe you started out really strong doing it. Maybe you're right in the middle of doing it right now and you just want prayer. I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you that as we step up and as we fulfill God's purpose in our lives, that we would do it with excellence. And even though Satan throws these fiery darts at us, we're going to do exactly what God has called us to do. I want to pray for you. God's given you a purpose. He's given you a mission. Hands are already going up. I want to pray for you as we do this audacious, as we live boldly, we would do boldly what God has called us to do. Father, I pray right now that you continue to move and work in our lives and that as we step up and do, God, what you've called us to do, as we live audaciously, God, may people see the power of God living inside of us and may we show that to the world. That even though the others look at us and they may think that we're strange and we're, they may think that we're crazy, we're going to do, God, what you've called us to do regardless of our circumstances and we're going to step up, God, and do that right now. God, I pray for those right now that you've called to do this specific purpose, maybe a specific job, just like you did John the Baptist. His job was just to prepare people for Jesus. 
And God, whatever job you've given to your people, I pray, God, we would step it up and do it, God, with excellence to bring glory and honor to your name. And I pray this, God, in the powerful peace of Jesus. As you continue to pray, there's those of you here today who says, man, I'm ready to live audacious, but I don't have a relationship with Jesus. I don't know him. I've heard about him. I've heard about him since I was little. But me personally, I don't have a personal relationship with Jesus. I want, I want to I pray for you. Right now, would you just, would you just call on God right now? Those, you, you know exactly who you are. You don't have a relationship with Jesus. And it doesn't, doesn't make it difficult. Just a relationship with Jesus. I want to pray for you right now. Would you just, would you just call it on God right now? Because you, you can call it on God right now. And just say, Lord Jesus, would you save me? Lord Jesus, will you save me and make me brand new? Take my life. I give it to you. I accept Jesus Christ as the Savior for my sins. I give my life to you. Take my life. Make me brand new. Now help me live the rest of the days of my life for you. Nobody's looking around and this is between me and you and God. I just want to pray for you. If you prayed that prayer this morning to receive Jesus, may I have the opportunity to pray for you? Would you just slip your hand up this morning and say, I prayed that prayer to receive Jesus? Father God, you're absolutely awesome. And I pray the day that you continue to move and work in our lives in an amazing way. That as we fulfill, God, your purpose for us, and as we do, God, what you've called us to do, that we would do it in an amazing way. That we continue to point people to you, Jesus. And as we get filled with what you've given us, we will be able to share that out with other people. God, I pray right now that the power of your Holy Spirit would set down upon us. And we would realize, God, that this same power that raised Jesus from the dead is the same power that lives in us. And I pray, God, as we leave here today, God, we're going to be charged. We're going to be fired up. That even though that sometimes we feel this way of the word upon us, we're not going to quit. We're not going to waver. We're going to go all the way to the very end. And even though John the Baptist found himself, God, stuck in a prison cell, sometimes, God, we find ourselves stuck in a prison cell that nobody cares we've been forgotten but god we're not going to quit we're going to keep fighting for our family we're going to fight for our faith we're going to fight for our jobs we're going to fight for our lives because god is so very worth it so god i pray right now that you bless everyone that's here that the power of your holy spirit rest upon us and that all we say and do that would bring glory and honor to you help us god as we leave from here today as we go to the grocery store and as we go out to eat and as we go to our jobs this week that we would show people jesus that we would invite people to church and that we would show everyone this power of god that lives down inside of us that we're not great but the one inside of us oh he's great and that's what we want to brag about to other people so i pray right now god that you'd fill us up and use us in an amazing way god we love you and praise you in jesus name amen would you give god some awesome praise he's absolutely awesome absolutely awesome I love you guys.